I'm Greg Jennett in, well, not so sunny Brisbane. The state of Queensland delivered a bounty to the LNP three years ago with 23 seats. But is the tide now about to turn for Labor? We'll take a look today on Afternoon Briefing. Hello and welcome to Afternoon Briefing. I'm Fran jo Kelly, joining you from Sydney on Gadigal land. Yes, so Fran, we're here in Queensland, of course, where the rain squalls are scudding in at regular intervals. We're high and dry where we are, Fran, but our thoughts do go out this afternoon to Queenslanders, particularly in the southeast, who find themselves under deluge once again. Hopefully, by this evening, much of this might clear away. The reason we're here, though, Fran, is that this weekend the Coalition's official campaign launch comes here to Brisbane. Today, though, it was Anthony Albanese who was out and about campaigning in this state, 1,600 kilometres north, Fran, in Cairns. Yep, it's a big state. Welcome aboard. It's a pretty sophisticated... It is. We're tough. <laughs> They're tough. <laughs> Have a very good eye. Great day. Go a lighter. <laughs> The opportunity is, is in Australia, we do things well, we get it right. We've absolutely got to eradicate the yellow crazy ant. Which is a threat to the reef and a threat to uh, the communities around Townsville and Cairns. 27 plans for the future, to make things better and to make things stronger. If this government is re-elected, it will be more arrogant, more out of touch. And I know Australians know that I can be a bit of a bulldozer when it comes to issues, and I suspect you guys know that too. A bulldozer wrecks things. A bulldozer knocks things over. I'm a builder. That's what I am. You've got to be doing things every day, and you've got to be across many, many issues. That's why you can't afford to have someone who's loose in the lodge. And now the Prime Minister is putting his hand up and saying, I'll change. Well, if you want change, change the government on May 21. With Christina Keneally, she is each way and every way when it comes to border protection. And on these issues, she just couldn't be trusted to follow through. We are now just eight days out from polling day and all this bloke has is fear and smears. Whether they're drug traffickers or bikies or others who will, as soon as they get out, will punt them. What's your name? Can we get a name? Supreme Leader. Chinese Australians are the greatest patriots you could hope for in this country. Support Gladys Liu, the Communist candidate for Australia. Chinese Australians, they're Australians. If anyone suggests that Chinese Australians are not Australians, I think that is offensive, divisive and un-Australian. Yes. You can't afford a loose unit in the lodge. He's saying that because the Australian people are onto this bloke. And that's why the next three years we can look forward to with optimism and we can look forward to with hope. I want a country where hope and optimism are the major emotions projected from our national government. There is the better times that are coming and that is because we've planned for them. He will not change. He will just get more arrogant, more out of touch, less trustworthy. Well, some of the colour and movement from day 31 of this election campaign. Greg, you're in Brisbane there for the Liberal campaign launch on Sunday and in a moment you're going to speak with the Home Affairs Minister, Karen Andrews. But in the meantime, the Defence Minister, Peter Dutton, has really been blowing the whistle on the presence of a Chinese spy ship off the coast of Western Australia, which he described as unusual. Its intention, of course, is to collect intelligence uh, right along the coastline and has been in close proximity to uh, military and intelligence installations on the west coast of Australia. Uh, it's uh, sighted uh, as at uh, 0600 hours this morning, uh, 250 nautical miles northwest of Broome and tracking northeast uh, at 12 knots. Um, it is uh, unusual in terms of the way in which it has 
uh, come so far south and uh, the way in which it's hugging the coastline as it heads up uh, in the direction of Darwin. Greg Peter Dutton said this ship was being closely tracked by Australia's agencies. We're in the dying days of an election campaign, Greg, where the Morrison government has been trying to contrast itself for months now as tough on China compared to the opposition. This disclosure does fit very neatly into the government's messages of are we in dangerous times, urging voters not to risk Australia's national security with Labor, doesn't it? Well, there's certainly an alignment of interest, that much we can say, Fran. The other questions, some of which we'll put to Karen Andrews, Home Affairs Minister, shortly, uh, are why. Uh, they go to the why question. Is this the new normal? As we all know, uh, defence as an institution uh, was once highly protective of all monitoring, all intelligence off our coastline, uh, other encounters that they may have had on the high seas well away from Australia. Usually we would either not hear about those or if we did it would come uh, in some really subtle way weeks or months later. Uh, maybe if this was done by Peter Dutton today on the advice of defence and intelligence community officials, maybe this is the new normal where governments of either stripe after the 21st of May are actively encouraged to get out there and call things out as they're detected. We don't know the answers to that, but we'll try and seek some. Yeah, you're absolutely right. We uh, remember when Scott Morrison was Immigration Minister, he'd famously talk about on-water matters. Peter Dutton was asked about this today. He said the practice now is to reveal China's movements, as they did recently, when a Chinese ship used a military-grade laser against the RA an RAAF plane. But the minister also revealed they've been tracking this ship for a week, Greg, and I understand Labor's not too impressed with uh, this happening in caretaker mode without them being briefed well before, you know, just before the minister made this announcement. Labor's only public comment so far, though, is we must always monitor to ensure the rules-based order in our region stays firm. But it is worth noting, Greg, a similar thing occurred on the East Coast in November. At that time, the Prime Minister said, and I'm quoting, they have every right to be where they are. We knew they were there. They were able to be there under maritime law, but we don't think for a second we're not, don't think for a second we're not keeping an eye on them as they are keeping an eye on us. And the Defence Minister at the time said, confirmed the sighting, but said they didn't break any laws. This time, though, the Defence Minister is not playing down the importance of this, Greg, as this exchange highlights. How would you characterise this ship right now? Is it an act of aggression? I think, I think it is a, a, an aggressive act, and I think particularly because uh, it has come so far south. For it to come south of Exmouth is without precedent. Well, we welcome now to Afternoon Briefing the Home Affairs Minister and member for McPherson from the Gold Coast, Karen Andrews. Welcome to Afternoon Briefing. Why don't we start with this matter we just heard the Defence Minister Peter Dutton explaining. Should Australians be alarmed uh, by the presence of this ship? We'll get to uh, the explanations as to why we've learnt of it in a moment, but the mere fact of it, should it concern Australians? Hello. Uh, let me be quite clear in relation to the incident that uh, we are now very much aware of off the west coast of Australia. It is something that it's very important that all Australians are aware of so that they understand that China has uh, tried to increase its surveillance of Australia. We've got the vessel that uh, we're currently volunteering. Uh, monitoring now. There was a vessel pre-Christmas uh, on the east coast of Australia. So their presence is here. They are clearly monitoring what is happening in Australia. So Australians need to be aware of the level of surveillance that, uh, that China is putting Australia under. Now, as Minister Dutton has said, it is concerning how far south that vessel has actually come. We're clearly monitoring it. We will continue to monitor that vessel. But its timing, uh, the time that it's here, its presence here is clearly of concern to the Australian government and uh, should be something that the Australian people are A, aware of and B, are able to closely monitor themselves. What do you mean by the term timing, Karen Andrews? Timing in its proximity to our federal election, uh, the Saturday after next, do you believe that is, is not coincidental? 
Well, I think we've always got to question uh, what the timing is. I mean, we all understand that uh, China is very strategic. It is very careful about what it does, when it does it, and how it does it. Now, we did have a vessel off the east coast of Australia pre-Christmas. It was actually in November uh, last year. And obviously we should be asking questions. Well, was there any significance about the timing of it being in uh, those waters at that time? And clearly there should be questions asked about uh, how long it was there and what it was actually doing. We currently have a vessel off the west coast of Australia. Why is it here now? What is it doing? These are pretty normal questions that everyone should be asking when we do find that, uh, that we have a Chinese vessel uh, off the coast of Australia. But are they reasonable questions that a government can answer or could answer? Uh, do you have an answer on why and why now? Well, uh, absolutely, they're questions that uh, we as a government are asking and we will continue to monitor uh, the situation. But obviously, we are very interested in why that vessel is uh, where it is and why it is here uh, right now. Now, you would have to say that it's fairly clear that it's, um, it's gathering uh, information, it's surveilling what is happening on the coast of uh, Australia. And yes, that is absolutely of concern uh, to us. We will continue to monitor it. And what people should understand is that the coalition will always take protecting our borders incredibly seriously. And that includes looking at the threats from other nations to Australia. That's why Minister Dutton has been out so strongly today, why Defence is doing all within its powers to closely monitor that activity off the west coast of Australia. And I would like to reassure uh, Australians that we are absolutely monitoring that situation as they would expect their government to do. All right, we'll get to other elements of your border security policy in just a moment. Uh, just finally, though, on, on the tactics employed by Peter Dutton today, do double barrelled question, Karen Andrews. Uh, was his decision to make this announcement based on defence and intelligence community advice, or was it a Peter Dutton call? Secondly, uh, when will the ALP be briefed? Why weren't the ALP briefed before the public announcement uh, in caretaker? Him. Well, look, um, clearly those are questions that should be directed to Minister Dutton in terms of his announcement today. But what I can say about Minister Dutton is that he is very considered about these issues himself. He would have taken advice before he made the announcement uh, today in respect of the uh, briefing for the opposition at the moment. I'm not sure of the status of that. Again, that's a, a matter that Minister Dutton would be dealing with. All right, let's take you to other elements of your border security policy outlined earlier today. Karen Andrews, uh, a returned Morrison government would seek to recover the costs of detention of non-citizens who are uh, subsequently ex uh, deported for crimes committed. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the value of the money that could be recouped here? Uh, are you plugging that into the Border Force budget? Well, clearly we'll take advice from the uh, agencies. What we have made very clear today is that we will seek to recover uh, costs from those, uh, particularly those, those criminals, the drug traffickers that are, that are here. Absolutely we will be doing that. Now it is something that uh, as the uh, re-elected government we would put all the detail around in terms of how we would go through the processes of putting that in place as you would expect an incoming uh, government again to be, uh, to be doing. We will work through the processes in relation to that but our policy position is very clear and that is that we will put in place the means to be able to recover uh, those monies. It is important and every single cent that we recover is going to be important. Sure. Why is it an election promise now though, just a week or so out from polling day when it could have been attempted mm -hmm. to be legislated or enacted in some way at any point in the last nine years? Mm -hmm. Well, there are a number of things that, uh, that we have been working on and also delivering during the, um, the last few years. And clearly, COVID was a priority for us and to be able to manage that. We've also done uh, a number of things in relation to ensuring that our borders are protected and will continue to be uh, protected. Now, we had put in place recoveries from uh, our pe people smugglers who are in this country. We are now making it very clear as part of our election commitments that a re-elected Morrison government would recover money from those foreign criminals 
uh, for the time that they spend in uh, detention here in Australia. And many, uh, many people in our community, many Australians would think that is absolutely the right thing to do. So it is actually a very natural progression from where we are with people smugglers. Sure. Now, uh, just because this is probably the last opportunity to ask you about the election before the day, Karen Andrews, 23 seats, high watermark for the coalition, the LNP here in Queensland. Uh, how much bark can the Morrison government afford to lose here in your state, uh, but still hang on? Well, all of my colleagues have been uh, working very hard for the last three years to make sure that they are supporting their communities. So we remain quietly confident of the seats that we are currently holding. We're actively uh, looking at picking up the seat of Blair. So we're looking to increase the number of seats that we have here in Queensland. I think a couple of uh, things are interesting. We really haven't seen a lot of the opposition uh, leader here or uh, many of the uh, opposition, the shadow um, ministers here uh, during the course of the, the campaign. We've seen very little from the Queensland State uh, Premier, so I think you know it's fair to ask a question as to uh, why she has been uh, so silent in the, in the campaign. I don't know if there's an issue between her and um, Anthony Albanese, but she's not been part of the campaign. But we're confident uh, that we will continue to uh, work hard to represent the good people of Queensland. Sure, Karen Andrews. I'm sure Labor are going to contest some of the assertions there about the campaigning activity of their senior leadership. But nonetheless, we thank you for making some time uh, from your busy schedule. Joining us on Afternoon Briefing today, Karen Andrews. Pleasure. Take care. All right. That's probably, that's probably an appropriate point at which to bring in Murray Watt, Labor Senator, because he was out and about campaigning in his home state, uh, way up north in Cairns, as we said earlier, which was exactly where Anthony Albanese was. Anthony Albanese priding himself these days on uh, regular and many campaign appearances here in Queensland. Here's our discussion with Murray Watt. We caught up with him just a little earlier. <laughs> Well, Murray Watt, great to be in your home state of Queensland, even though we're separated by several hundred kilometres. I believe you've got the better of the weather up in the north of Queensland there. Can I start by asking you about this uh, news that's come from Peter Dutton, the Defence Minister, Australia tracking a Chinese spy ship off the coast of Western Australia. Does that cause you any alarm to hear those facts outlined by Peter Dutton? Yes, Greg, uh, and welcome to Queensland. Uh, these are obviously very serious matters that Peter Dutton has raised this afternoon, uh, and I can assure you that Labor takes them very seriously. Uh, we have sought a briefing from the federal government on them to better understand the facts of the situation, uh, and it's obviously appropriate for that to, that to occur during caretaker. Uh, it's probably not appropriate for me to say much more than that until we get a few more facts uh, from the government on what's actually going on. OK, it strikes us as somewhat unusual to have it so publicly declared what is normally, let's face it, a fairly sensitive matter around intelligence gathering. Is this something, in principle, that Labor supports? Uh, moreover, Murray Watt, is this something that an incoming Labor government, if we got one, would make common practice itself? Well, as I say, we take these issues extremely seriously. Anything to do with national security is a serious matter affecting the Australian people and we intend to approach them seriously if we're fortunate enough to uh, be elected next weekend. Uh, I think in terms of ministers making comments on these things, uh, I think when these issues do get raised, then you know, people should be transparent with the public. Uh, it, would be, it would be helpful for us as the alternative government to have a few more facts about what the situation is, and that's certainly what we'll be seeking during this briefing that we've asked for from the government. Now, I appreciate that you don't have much information to run on, but uh, I guess my question just finally on this, uh, you don't see any sort of electoral motivation, political motivation behind the Defence Minister fronting as he did there? Is it, to be blunt, uh, viewed by Labor as an attempt to kind of stake out national security as a messaging issue heading into the last week or so? Well, I would certainly hope not, Greg. I would certainly hope that we don't have a government that misuses security information uh, for political advantage. I'm not alleging that. Uh, these are serious matters, obviously, uh, and, and, I mean, really it's a matter for the government uh, as to how they're using it and what their motivations might be. Uh, but all I can do is assure the Australian public that we are taking these seri things seriously. 
Fair enough. Let's bring it back home, uh, literally, to your home state. You've been so critical uh, earlier this year about the federal response to flooding. The rain is heavy in the southeast of Queensland, but nowhere near as severe as back in February. Are you making any calls or any suggestions about a federal response, the movement of defence personnel today or tonight? Peter Dutton says that up to 620 are available to be moved. Do you think they should be? Well, I've been in regular contact with uh, the Queensland Government, particularly the Emergency Services Minister Mark Ryan, about these floods. Uh, and you're right, Greg, it's, it's terrible to see this happening yet again in many parts of Queensland. Uh, there are some parts of Queensland, and I'm thinking particularly around the Wide Bay, Meribara region uh, and the Lockyer Valley, which in some cases have already flooded three to four times this year. Uh, and that it is a real worry that we see this kind of flooding and this sort of heavy rainfall happening in May, uh, which even in Queensland in the subtropics is something that we're not used to seeing. Uh, so it's another reminder that we do need to take these issues seriously and be better prepared for the changing climate that we see all around us. Uh, I'm confident that the Queensland Government and the Australian Government will work uh, cooperatively and I certainly hope that they will uh, around the deployment of ADF. Uh, I'm not aware of any request from the State Government to deploy ADF personnel but certainly if that request is made of course I'd be encouraging the Government to move on that. I think the one thing that it has raised Greg is that it's another reminder about the fact that we just are not getting prepared enough for natural disasters in this country. I mean we are getting to a point where areas that have experienced floods once every 10 years or 20 years. It's happening every one or two years now. Uh, and again, I call on the government to make use of its emergency response fund. Uh, that obviously came to light through the Lismore floods. Um, and as I've said to you before, Greg, this is now nearly $5 billion that's sitting there held by the Morrison government. It's been there for three years. They still haven't built a single disaster mitigation project using that fund. And meanwhile, we see floods continue to happen around the country. Every time one of these events occurs, I think we ask ourselves, why aren't we doing more about it? Why aren't we using those funds to keep people safe? Sure. I won't take you through all the ins and outs of that argument. As you say, we did discuss it at greater length uh, back through February and March. But uh, your position in the near term or in the immediate term, let's say this afternoon and this evening, is you're quite satisfied that the Commonwealth should sit back and, and wait to be asked by Queensland for any assistance on, on this occasion today? Well, that's certainly how the processes normally operate, Greg, and I haven't heard anything to suggest that, uh, that defence personnel are needed at this point in time. Of course, if that situation changes, uh, then we do need to use the defence forces and every other arm uh, of the federal government to swing into gear, and it's something that we haven't seen enough from the federal government in the past. Uh, as we all learned through the Lismore floods and the, and the Queensland floods recently, uh, the, the federal government does have the power to declare a national emergency uh, without necessarily considering consulting the state government. Uh, I'm not aware of the situation reaching that sort of gra gravity at this point in time, but if it does, then of course we want the federal government to move much more quickly than what we have in the past. Every disaster this country has seen under Scott Morrison's leadership, he's been slow to act, blames other people, doesn't take responsibility. We can't let that happen to people again. All right, you've been out with Anthony Albanese in the north around Cairns today. A quick stock take from you, if you can, Murray Watt, on the state of the campaign here in Queensland. At uh, recent times in the past, uh, seats of, uh, seat numbers of up to eight have been nominated by Labor as potential gains. Can I put to you that uh, that is still looking extremely ambitious? How does that number sit with your reckoning right now? Uh, well, I'm probably a bit cautious when it comes to seat predictions, Greg, and of course Labor doesn't necessarily need to win eight seats in Queensland to win government overall, but we would certainly like to improve our position compared to we, where we were after the last federal election. Uh, what I can say, Greg, you know, I've been on the road with Albo now in both Leichhardt and Flynn, two key regional seats in Queensland that we're trying to win, uh, and I've personally been campaigning in other seats around the state, seats like Brisbane, Ryan, Bowman, Bonner, over the last few days. And what's really noticeable to me wherever I've been in Queensland is that there definitely is a shift in the mood towards Labor, whether it be in the regions, the outer suburbs and the inner cities. Uh, and I think different parts of Queensland uh, have sort of switched on to this campaign and switched on to this Prime Minister, frankly, at different points in time. But there definitely is a bit of a move towards Labor going on, which is very encouraging. Uh, the other thing about Queensland that I think is quite different to other states is that we have a tradition of swinging quite late and quite hard. Uh, 
and, you know, frankly, the way the Prime Minister's behaving at the moment, flailing around, throwing all sorts of messages and punches at different people in all sorts of different directions, I think Queenslanders are sort of scratching their heads wondering why they'd give this bloke another go. So, uh, you know, we've got another week to go. I'm hopeful and confident that Labor will finish the straight campaign strongly. Uh, and as a result, I'm certainly hopeful that there'll be a few more Queenslanders in the Labor caucus uh, after the election. I'm sure you are, and we'll know soon enough. Murray Watt, it's a big state. I know you've got to get back on the move through it almost immediately. So we'll thank you for joining us once again on Afternoon Briefing. Thanks, Greg. Good to talk to you. Well, we're heading into the final week of this election campaign and today we've seen a change of tone from Scott Morrison signalling to the voters that if they give him another three years, they'll see a different side of the PM. Over the last three years and particularly the last two, what have Australians have needed for me, from me going through this pandemic has been strength and resilience. Now, I admit that hasn't enabled Australians to see a lot of other gears in the way I work. And I know Australians know that I can be a bit of a bulldozer when it comes to issues, and I suspect you guys know that too. But you know, over the last few years, that's been pretty important to ensure we've been able to get through some of the most important things that we've had to do. Because as we go into this next period, on the other side of this election, I know there are things that are going to have to change with the way I do things. Because we're moving into a different time. We're moving into a time of opportunity and working from the strong platform of strength that we've built and, and saved in our economy in these last three years, we can now take advantage of those opportunities in the future. Scott Morrison has today said he's a bulldozer. That is, a bulldozer wrecks things. A bulldozer knocks things over. I'm a builder. That's what I am. And if I'm elected Prime Minister, I'll build things in this country. This Prime Minister has four years in office, and what he's saying is, if you vote for Scott Morrison, I'll change. That's what he's saying. Vote for me, and I'll change. Well, if you want change, change the government. Change the government, because we can't just have three more years of the same. I'm joined now by Amy Ramikas, The Guardian's political reporter, Claire Armstrong from The Daily Telegraph, and the ABC's Queensland news reporter, Matt Wordsworth. Queenslanders, all of them, thank you for joining us. Claire, you were there when Scott Morrison delivered those lines we just heard about being the bulldozer, about having more gears that we haven't seen yet. Is this his real Julia moment? I mean, I think what he's trying to say is that circumstances required him to act one way and, and now those circumstances are passing. He can uh, maybe revert back to a version of himself we haven't seen. So, yeah, it is effectively his real Julia moment. The real question is going to be whether Australians believe that his actions in the last two, three years have been entirely dictated by the things happening around him or whether that is just the way that he is and the way that he leads and, and pandemic or otherwise, that's the, the kind of person that he, he, see, he is, regardless of how he sees himself. Amy Ramikas, what did you think when you heard that? What is Scott Morrison promising here and why? Well, he's promising that he'll move, different, uh, move forward differently and in the why is because he's behind in the polls and focus groups are saying that he is the problem for the coalition, that he is just not popular. In terms of what I thought, I just... Scott Morrison has been in the parliament since 2007. He held social services, he held immigration, he held treasury. He has not changed his approach at any time. Scott Morrison has always been Scott Morrison, which is, as he said, that bulldozer just moving forward. And while, yes, the pandemic did require certain decisions to be made, it wasn't the pandemic fault that for how he reacted in terms of the women's issues that we heard. It wasn't the pandemic's fault, but when we had the bushfire it wasn't the pandemic's fault for natural disasters. Scott Morrison's biggest problem is Scott Morrison, and he's now trying to distance himself from himself. He's trying to distance himself from him, himself. Matt, I'm going to come to you in a second because I want to know what Queensland has been telling you. But, Claire, do you think that what's what going on, the, 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 the realisation they're behind, they have to throw something at this, the break last moment, and is it risky? Oh, it's incredibly risky because he's put um, his own character front and centre of the election debate in the final week. It is a big gamble. The issue is for the coalition, uh, partly from their own way of attacking 
ads and partly from the fact that um, Anthony Albanese has had those stumbles in press conferences, a lot of their focus in the last four weeks has been don't trust Anthony Albanese, don't vote with him. And that has, as we know, still left a lot of undecided voters who have even softened as the campaign has gone along. Now they need them to swing toward the coalition. And as Amy says, if the barrier there is that people are disgruntled with Scott Morrison himself, then he is the problem. And he has to try and say, I can change, which obviously then becomes a debate about whether we believe that's true or not. All right, Matt, as I say, you're there in Queensland. You've been moving around a bit in the uh, early part of this campaign in particular. What have voters had to say to you, if anything, about Scott Morrison, about what they're thinking about of him? Well, Fran, I was actually having a chat to a, a young fella who's been door knocking for Labor for the past year here in Brisbane. And it was interesting that he was telling me it wasn't not so much that people were saying, oh, I like Labor, uh, but I, I don't like Scott Morrison. Uh, and it's interesting that Scott Morrison has self-diagnosed that that might be the problem that he's facing. I'm also interested in who Scott Morrison is trying to reach with these comments, because here in Queensland, he's actually quite popular. 23 out of the 30 seats, and I was up in the central Queensland seats of Flynn and Capricornia, Rockhampton, uh, only a couple of weeks ago. And you get the sense that no one's talking about change of government there. No one's talking about changing to Labor there. So I wonder if Scott Morrison is starting to talk to the southern half of Australia with that kind of this will be a different Scott type of comment. Yeah, Amy, you mentioned earlier, or one of you did anyway, that this flows from focus groups, and uh, I think that's pretty clear. I've heard from the very start from people who are doing focus groups with undecided voters the deep dislike for Scott Morrison on display, but also at the beginning there was some nervousness about trusting the economy, if you like, to Anthony Albanese. Um, the Prime Minister until now has been riffing on the ladder. Now he's made this change. Is it too late, do you think? I mean, as, as Matt said there, is he trying to send a message down south and is it too late? Well, it's never too late in an election campaign, especially one that is as tight as this one is, because we know it's not a national mood that we're seeing with this election campaign. It's it's down to individual electorates. And I know that seems like a pretty like obvious comment, but what I mean by that is we're going to see some pretty wild swings in individual electorates, which may not be uh, turned out across the country. So in Queensland, the coalition is pretty much at capacity. There, there's not many seats that they can win there. So it absolutely is the southern seats that he is trying to win. And he's trying to keep Western Australia at the same time. It's just whether after three and a half years as prime minister and his long history of senior portfolios in the government, whether people can now believe that Scott Morrison can change. And he's only got eight days to Show, show people that he can. OK, well, we saw a real change. I mean, not just in his language, but also, I think, in the... Um, I hate to resort to body language, but I will anyway, and tone coming from the two leaders. We had Scott Morrison with that sort of about face and, you know, very much change of tone and promising more of it. We had Anthony Albanese on the front foot. We saw a little bit earlier, I'm sure you've seen it, him talking about, you know, he's not a bulldozer, he's a builder, and him with a very sort of upbeat, optimistic message. It, have we seen a shift in confidence happen today? Is this a, a bit of a, a seismic shift, Claire, do you think, in both camps? I think that the Labor campaign has been steadily growing in confidence and steam, and, and that's obviously with a backdrop of them being incredibly um, cautious of what to read into, be it polls or what they're seeing on the ground after 2019. But he definitely feels, I think, from those comments today, you can see he feels that not only is the debate in the last couple of days been in his territory on the issue of wages, which is something Labor have tried to have as the focus of the economic conversation for months now, but now that we're also talking about Scott Morrison's character, which he obviously, uh, Anthony Albanese obviously feels is a strength. For, for Morrison, I think that that shift, as much as I said it's a gamble, it is sort of a, a confidence play in the sense that they do feel heartened by the fact there are still so many undecided mm. voters and that now it's really a tussle over who has the best positive message to say, to, to kind of maybe not even say Australians have to like voting for Scott Morrison, but to at least feel comfortable parking their vote there. Yeah, I mean, privately, uh, the Liberal ministers I've spoken to are making much of what they call the soft vote in the middle there. Just, Claire, with you for a moment there, are you have you picked up a change of mood or a change of panic in the Morrison camp where you are? 
Um, I've been on Morrison's bus for nearly two weeks now, and I would say that there's definitely been um, mood swings over the <laughs> over that time. Um, felt pretty good over in WA. It's less so in the last few days in in, in uh, New South Wales and Victoria. Obviously in Victoria again today, where he's hit. Um, interestingly, not just Chisholm, a, a marginal seat to defend, but but earlier we were in McEwen, which is generally a, a safe Labor seat that the coalition obviously feel quite excited and energised about. So I think that there's just a determination and as much as maybe Morrison doesn't like describing himself as a bulldozer, his campaign trajectory and the pace and, and just the way that they absolutely keep going with the plan is almost like a bulldozer. So uh -huh. there's still an element of that in, in the way that he's behaving. OK, we're going to come to the Dutton moment, minute, moment in a second. But Matt, before I do, cost of living, it's been sort of amongst the top issues for people. People. Is that still, is that the number one issue there in Queensland? And as I say, it's a big state, different issues coming into play in different parts. Yeah, the day-to-day -day political cycle throws up a lot of uh, issues that aren't necessarily being spoken about out in the community. And housing is a massive, massive sleeper issue. You go to anywhere and, uh, and speak to just a handful of people and someone's going to raise the cost of buying a house or renting a house or the inability to rent a house. So that's going to do um, weigh heavily mm -hmm. on a lot of people's minds because if you look at Sydney and Melbourne right now in the month-to-month -month data, prices are falling there. They're still going up in Brisbane and they're still going up very, very much in regional Queensland as well because we're a lagging market to Sydney and Melbourne. They went up first and we always go up second. So that's still a live issue here. <laughs> Just um, while Scott Morrison was promoting his softer side, should we put it that way, in the West, Peter Dutton was in full-on defence minister mode, warning us about this Chinese spy ship, which is, you know, fair enough. He described it as an aggressive act. Um, Amy, do we just take that at face value? I mean, the timing of this just made my eyebrows raise pretty much up to cans, I think. But uh, the ship because is there. The ship is the there. Ship, the not ship is there. No, he's not making it up. But the ship has been there for a week. And there have been other ships in Australian waters, uh, which we've known about, which have done much the same thing, which haven't been a problem previously in terms of we're watching them and we know that they're watching us. But as long as everyone abides by international laws, we're all fine with it. And in fact, Defence released a statement not long after Peter Dutton's press conference in WA, pretty much saying exactly that in the second last paragraph. Uh, Matt, though, it's better the government tells us about these things and doesn't tell us about these things. You know, Scott Morrison, as Immigration Minister, didn't like to tell us what, the, the, what was happening on water. We had on water matters. Uh, well, I'm not going to pretend to look into the mind of either Scott Morrison or Peter Dutton about what their motivation for bringing this to light, whether it was just a commitment to transparency, uh, which of course is um, something that people desire but often not gained in the area of defence and home affairs. Uh, but this is something that's happened to them. It's not like they've launched a freedom of navigation exercise through the South China Sea, which would yeah. obviously be something that was quite provocative as well. That's a good point. Sometimes these things intervene in an election campaign. Sometimes they help you. Uh, sometimes they don't, like an interest rate rise, Claire. I mean, is this, um, could this be Scott Morrison's Tampa moment? Uh, I'm not sure that it's that significant, not in the least, because it's something that we have we know has happened a few times, even in recent years, where there were warships obviously watching over some military exercises off the coast of central Queensland. We had the incident earlier in the year where um, a laser was actually pointed from a Chinese ship at, a, at an Australian um, uh, aircraft. So it's not so shocking and new and dramatic that I think it will um, dramatically impact the electorate, but it does bring the conversation back around to a kind of national security question, uh, discussion that the coalition feels more comfortable having, obviously having largely been able to talk about this because of the situation in the Solomon. So really, it's, um, it's a way for them to go back to what they feel is their strength territory, but without having to necessarily deal with the, the Solomon issue, though I don't know how they'll escape that entirely. Well, I guess I've only got a week to, to try and manage that dichotomy. We did see a foreign policy debate between Maurice Payne and Penny Wong today, which dealt with that a lot. Um, just finally, Claire, the Liberal launch this Sunday in Brisbane. Will the new look Scott Morrison be front and centre, do you think? And does that mean we're likely to get a major promise on, I don't know, an issue like aged care or perhaps housing again? Uh, housing. Do you have any intel? Um, I'm, I've heard that cost of living, um, unsurprisingly, will feature as sort of the centrepiece for the day. Um, probably some kind of assistance measure that targets particular cohorts. I think 
the coalition are well established and who they think is is out there still undecided and, and can be won over and, and who is a bit of a lost cause, if you like, in terms of support for the coalition. So we're expecting on uh, when we head up to Brisbane on Sunday there to be some kind of um, measure to sort of deal with what we know has been these issues for Morrison during the campaign with inflation, mortgage rate increases and, and of course housing and other costs going up dramatically compared to what Australians are, are earning to be able to pay for these things. Yeah, well interesting, Matt raised housing is a big issue up there and is in that state. Amy, what are you expecting? Have you got any intel? Uh, I believe that there is something on housing to try and counteract Labor's housing policy and, as Claire said, cost of living. But it's really going to be a consolidation of the coalition's messages, which is all around the economy and who do you trust with it. And, and Matt, just finally from you, it's interesting to me that they're, they're having this in Queensland. Labor had theirs in the West because they were trying to garner seats there. Uh, Libs, uh, though Karen Andrews said the Libs think they might pick up Blair. Are you hearing that? Look, the seats that I think uh, are really worth watching in Queensland are for two reasons. Firstly, Leichhardt, Anthony Albanese has been there four or five times already and Scott Morrison and Barnaby Joyce have been there right up the top of Queensland. Why is that significant? Queensland uh, would like to be represented in the government. Uh, at the moment, Labor's most northerly seat is, well, Kilcoy is the biggest population centre in Blair, and that's about an hour from here, or two and a half hours, given the Bruce Highway traffic on a Friday afternoon. Whereas Leichhardt is right up the top there, and it doesn't look like they're going to be very successful in Flynn and Capricorn at the moment. So you'd want to see a government that represented more than just above the Pine, North Pine River uh -huh. and Kilcoy in Brisbane. And secondly, the seat of Ryan, a Liberal-held seat, in terms of what's happening with the Green vote, because you can read uh, also in Brisbane at the same point. Is the Green vote going to impact Labor in, an, uh, in Brisbane? So okay. they're the two things I think are going to be very interesting. All right. Amy Ramikas, Matt Wordsworth and Claire Armstrong, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Pleasure. We've like the greatest week. nation Thanks. on earth. <laughs>
Australia acting in our national interest will always be keeping a close eye on them and ensuring we're in Prime Minister, Prime Minister, Peter Dutton has described it as an act of aggression. Do you agree with that terminology? Well, I, I certainly don't believe that when you take it together with the many other coercive acts and the many statements that have been made which have been attacking Australia's national interests, you could describe it as an act of bridge building or friendship. Prime Minister, this has happened Prime off the coast of WA. Prime yeah. Minister, this has happened off the coast of WA. Yes. West Australian Premier Mark McGowan has this morning described Peter Dutton's comments as preparing for pe to preserve peace, you have to prepare for war. He's described those comments as grossly irresponsible. Do you agree with Mark McGowan or Peter Dutton? Well, I addressed those uh, comments this morning at our press conference earlier today. And of course, everything we do is about ensuring that we can provide peace and stability uh, within the region. In and that's, and that's event, why though. we do it. I mean, this event is of no surprise to us. That's why we have been taking the actions we have since we first came to government, to ensure that we've been building up our defence capability, we're building, building up our cyber technology capability, we've been building our alliances and partners. The AUKUS agreement, the most significant defence agreement we've seen signed in this country since ANZA 70 years ago. So this is why we've been doing what we've been doing. This is why this is a very significant time in, in Australia's history and for our region and why having a government that does understand these issues deeply and has been taking consistent action over a long time to ensure Australia is resilient and able to deal with these threats and challenges, while at the same time building the alliances and partnerships within our so region which keep strong. Australians safe. Now, I've, I've discussed these matters with Mark on many occasions. You know, I, I work closely with Mark McGowan. We know each other well. But Mark has always said in these circumstances that he understands that it's a Commonwealth responsibility to deal with these issues. The Premier of Western Australia is, is not responsible for looking after our defence and our foreign he interests. Well, he's entitled to his views, but he's not responsible for Australia's defence and national security. Peter Dutton and I are, and Australians expect us to ensure that we're doing everything we can to keep Australians safe, to keep a close eye on these issues, and be always preparing. So while this in particular, uh, this particular voyage that has been undertaken by the PLA Navy down the west coast of Australia is something we are keeping a very close eye on. It is just a reminder of the times in which we live and why it's very, very important that we continue to keep a very strong approach when it comes to boosting up our defence forces, boosting up our capabilities to deal with these types of threats and at the same time working with our partners and allies in the region um, the United States, of course, Japan and India through the Quad, and that meeting is coming up very, very soon. But in addition to that, we were the first country to have a comprehensive strategic partnership agreed with ASEAN, with all the Southeast Asian nations. So we have been positively working with countries in our region, as well as our Quad partners, to ensure that we are providing for peace and stability in the region for a free and open right. Indo-Pacific, and that's what we'll always do. Well, did somebody say national security? There's a couple of words we've heard an awful lot of this afternoon, the Prime Minister speaking just a little earlier in Melbourne. Now, also earlier in our program this afternoon, we heard from Labor Senator Murray Watt expound his theory that when Queensland swings, it swings big. Labor would be hoping that, but so too would the Greens, and that's why we're joined here in Brisbane this afternoon by Green Senator Larissa Waters. Welcome, Senator. This might be the most curious question I've asked Larissa all campaign. How on earth do you campaign in this weather uh, in Queensland? The, uh, the How to Vote cards have been getting very wet indeed, and my boots are soaked, Greg, but I think the real issue is people are really worried about this torrential rain. Um, I, I'm concerned that we might see loss of life soon. And just three months after we had a terrible deluge here in South East Queensland, people are really feeling very anxious and they'd love something to be done about the climate crisis so that these floods and rains aren't getting worse and worse. We might get to that. Of course, uh, pre-polling is already open mm. and, yeah, I suppose seriously, uh, all parties, yours included, are trying to have those stations manned with the how to votes. It actually would become 
almost impossible under some circumstances. Well, look, there's a lot of solidarity when you're huddling under an umbrella and uh, all, yes, wishing, that, wishing for the rain to clear. Yeah. <laughs> okay. no, the voters have been coming out. It's been a really good vibe, notwithstanding the weather. All right, I will explore that a little further with you. But just on this issue of the day, we heard from the Prime Minister uh, talking about this Chinese spy ship. Are you suspicious in any way about this announcement and the Australian government's motivations behind making it? Yes, I am suspicious, Greg, and my understanding is the presence of this ship has been known about for several days now. So it's somewhat interesting timing um, that we've had not one but two press conferences today to tell people how scared they should be. Um, and one wonders how much of this is reality and how much of this is a desperate campaign from a government that hasn't really campaigned on terribly much other right. than the other guys terrible but, but and now you, they're uh, trying to scare people into voting for them. Okay, but are you arguing for full transparency? That is, that this announcement could have, should have been made several days ago or that somehow it's kind of been beaten up out of not much well, at all? Well, I mean, I don't purport to be in charge of national security and I've obviously not seen the national security briefings, but I think the timing is very interesting. And I think the fact that we've had not just Minister Dutton, but now the Prime Minister as well for the last minute press conference really shows you how desperate they are to make people scared about a situation that may or may not be a serious one. I've not seen the briefings when actually people are scared about their homes being flooded, they're scared about the cost of living and they're scared about not being able to afford to send their um, relative to the dentist or yep. go themselves. So All I right. think there's real things people are scared about and the Prime Minister once again is not actually campaigning on the things that actually matter to everyday people. All right, let's take it back to your campaign here in the state of Queensland. You're not up for election in 2022, but your lead candidate Penny Orman Payne is. What gives you the confidence? I know people are using this phrase that we're in Greenland, play of course on Queensland. What gives you the confidence that the dial has shifted a little three years on from what was not a very successful campaign for the Greens in this state? in 2019? Well, our vote has continued to hold and we've in fact increased our number of state MPs. So it feels like we've been building um, and I've been very, very proud to have been returned by Queenslanders each time. But this time around, you're right, the mood really does feel different. I think people are fed up with a government that takes money from big corporations and seems to prioritise the interests of political donors rather than ordinary Queenslanders, that hasn't done anything about the climate crisis, that hasn't made the dentist more affordable, that hasn't made university free, that's done nothing on the affordable housing crisis. And they hear the Greens putting those big ideas out there. They're not hearing a lot of policy debate from the yeah. two big parties, Greg, but they're desperate for something to change. So where do I you think pick that's that why up? the mood's different. OK, and where do you pick that up? Where does it manifest itself? I'm going to suggest without any detailed knowledge that you were talking about a handful, less than a handful of inner urban seats. Well I get Brisbane. about the state quite a bit because I represent all of Queensland and I'm getting a really positive sentiment no matter where I go and I've travelled quite a lot Well, in the 10 years I've been doing this job but in particular this year. Um, people everywhere are feeling the pinch so cost of living is a real issue and they're not seeing actual plans beyond a few sugar hit bribes that the Prime Minister dished out to really tackle that and again they're not seeing anything about how we fix the climate crisis, how we make that transition to a job rich 100% clean energy economy which people know um, will be a great thing for our economy as well as for our communities. What about further north though? I imagine there's a markedly different mood in, in central and northern Queensland and let's face it we're not seeing much of Bob Brown <laughs> or anyone uh, driving through those parts of the state well, this time around. I was just in Mackay last week and again people are worried about the cost of living, they're worried about the lack of housing, they're worried about the climate and they're worried about what comes next after coal. Those coal workers know that their product is not going to be wanted by the world pretty soon and they want to know that the government acknowledges that and has a plan. This government doesn't have that plan. They're hooked on the donations from the coal and gas companies and the Labor opposition equally supports 114 new coal and gas mines. Yeah. Those communities have a pretty good radar for, for what's nonsense and they know that the Greens actually want to plan ahead, look after them as we change the basis of our economy. Sure, but in and the here and now, crisis. some of those communities, the coal exports are going gangbusters and I guess in time, with a bit of flow through, uh, they're going to feel the benefits of that. It becomes a much harder argument to run, isn't it, around well, coal just... communities here right now when you look at what's going on in Asia and in Europe, the demand 
I'm it's just sharing what people in Mackay have told me, mm. um, what people in Gladstone are telling me and what they're telling Penny, who's of course our regional sure. public school teacher, our Senate candidate who lives in Gladstone, which has been fairly reliant on fossil fuels in the past. They know the change is coming. They want a plan for what happens next. None of the other parties are giving them that. They're not actually being very honest about the fact that the economy will change and all of the opportunities that that could present. And just finally, Larissa Waters, who is it that Penny Ormond Payne has to see off here in your calculation? Is it one of the Labor senators or do you need to somehow, ironically, edge out the, the Hansons or the Palmers, well, which way does it it's, cut? It's Pauline Hanson or um, one of the Liberal Party senators whose seat we will take if Penny Ormond Payne, our regional teacher, is successful and um, that will shift the balance of power and it will mean that the Greens will be a powerful force in the Senate to be able to push a new government to go further on things like housing, dental into Medicare, making uni free, all the things that actually will improve people's daily lives. Yep, well if, it, if you pulled it off it would be a significant addition to the Greens numbers and I think we had on our afternoon briefing some analysis yesterday that said you know you may be looking at a, a pickup at least in Adelaide or another state too so that would bring the party room to I think uh, we'll have, pretty high numbers. I think we'll have three new senators and I think we might even have some lower house members possibly even from Queensland Greg but we're working hard and that's up to the voters. Yeah let's leave that to them and to the AEC but Larissa Waters Green Senator from Queensland thanks for joining us today on afternoon briefing best of luck with the rest of the campaign. Thanks so much Greg. Okay, so uh, yeah, that's that's about it from us here. Our time is uh, fast drawing to a close on what's been a pretty pacey afternoon, hasn't it, Fran? In between uh, all the weather that's happening here, we're trying to keep up with this uh, announcement from the government about which we've been uh, speaking at some length. You get the impression the whole national security uh, argument has a way to run after today, Fran. of tactic from Scott Morrison uh, trying to sort of make himself more attractive to the voters uh, indicates they've got some polling suggesting he's got work to do on that front and then this shift by Peter Dutton with this announcement on national security national security was where the government started off trying to get inroads in this election they're back on that territory now it's obviously territory they feel is strong for them yep well that's yeah. Okay. Yep, that's it from us. Goodbye. We'll be back See next you, week. See you, Greg.